okay, record on this computer. All right. So some of the ideas that I mentioned at the end of last time were um, related to this idea of the fact that, um, you know, you can, you can do stuff like you can compute. Oh, right now my tablet's not on. There we go. Okay, good. So, you know, you can take a term like um, lambda x y dot y applied to um, lambda z dot z applied to lambda w dot w. And so one way of reducing this would be to say, okay, let's, um, there, there's, there's two redexes in here. There's two places we can do some um, computation. There's, um, let me try to highlight them. The whole thing is a redex because here's a lambda applied to a term. And then down inside here, there's another redex because here's a lambda expression applied to another term. So there are two redexes in here. And that means that, um, you know, we can go, uh, I guess I want that black. So one thing you could do is you could say, okay, let's do the orange one first. And that says, okay, replace all the, so it's going to be a lambda y did i write it down wrong uh yep dot y and excuse me I got that wrong. It's just going to be a, um, yeah. I'm gonna replace all the free occurrences of X and here by this, there are none, so it becomes lambda Y dot Y. Now, going the other way, doing the yellow one first, we go over this way and we say, oh, okay, this is the same as lambda X y applied to lambda w dot w. And now this one reduces in the star notation in zero more steps to lambda y dot y. And this one reduces also in just one beta step to lambda y dot y. So this is beta, 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 and beta. And so, you know, you could try this out for hours and you'll discover, oh gosh, it seems like this always holds. If I reduce some, uh, if I do some beta reduction and I get a different term here from this one, then I can do some more beta reduction and they become the same. And um, it turns out that's a theorem. I'm just checking to see if my notes have arrived. No, let's see. No, oh, that is so strange. Oh, God. All right. So, um, so this thing is a theorem. This is something that just is always true. Now, for today's lecture, I am going from a book that um, Finley McElwain pointed me out to, pointed out to me, and it's a really nice book. I've linked to it in some of the previous things, it's called this um, program and those two vertical lines, those two horizontal lines are like a big equals on the side of the book. Whoops, on the side of the book, it says 
program equals proof by this guy, um, Samuel Mimram, who is um, at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. The, the French are, big, you know, love this stuff. And it's a really, it's actually a very nice book on with kind of like the goal of getting to the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So I'm taking the exa some of the examples from his um, his book today on um, what's called confluence is, is the section. So where is my pen? Okay, confluence. And the idea behind confluence is 3.4.1 in the book is that if you have this kind of situation where you have some term and you do some beta reduction, zero or more steps, and you can do a different, perhaps different sequence of beta reduction, um, to get to, uh, so this one, let's say, goes to U, and he typically uses U1 and U2 or U and U prime in the book. And so if I can go a different way with some zero or more steps of beta reduction, and I get to U prime, then, and the way that these diagrams can be read is that the dotted line means that something exists and the solid line is like a for all. So that there exist reductions, beta reductions, in zero or more steps that take you down to some common V. And so if we just write this out, like in the mathematical form, what do we get? We get, um, where is this thing? Okay, we get, you know, for every T, um, U, U prime, if T goes to U, U in some zero or more steps, and T goes to, beta reduces to U prime in zero or more steps. That implies, and I'm using, I don't know, I mean, uh, maybe I should use the arrow. I normally would use an arrow for implies, but, um, and probably I should here. I don't know, it's just that in, I'm teaching principles of programming language this semester, and we're doing, operational semantics and the book there uses, you know, this horseshoe symbol. So, all right, let me try to write the one that I would no normally write here, which is, you know, an arrow. Where is that thing? Okay. That implies that there exists a V such that U goes in zero or more steps beta reduction to V and U prime goes in zero or more steps of beta reduction to V. So if you have this situation where you're kind of, you know, you're in this divergent situation here where T can go to U like we did in the previous one, this term went one place that's obviously different from this, but then they can come back together. Now this is by zero steps. You know, we could have had another um, example where, you know, you did many steps going down one path, many steps going down another path, but they always can come back together. So this is a pretty, really, this is a pretty astounding uh, property, right? This says in this computation system, I just start doing beta reduction. I can always come back together no matter which 
beta, which, which read X's I choose, I can always get back to a, a different path. So that's a huge, huge property. So, but the proof of this property is pretty hard. This is a, I'd say this is a difficult proof. Um, and so the, what's the, the strategy for doing this proof? Because if you try to work on it straightforward, you just can't really figure it out. Um, you know, it, it, if you just start trying to like brute force your way. And so there's a kind of something that's very nice here, which is, so the strategy for the proof and the strategy is due to a logician called Tate. And the strategy is step one is define um, a new um, reduction relation, which we'll call arrow double star or arrow, double arrow like that. And it's transitive closure of this star. And it's going to have the following nice property. It's going to be such that arrow, this double arrow star is identical to beta star. And so I guess uh, then the idea is that it becomes easier to show that show that and I can maybe I you know I'm not sure maybe equals is too strong a term here. I don't think so. I think that it's like you know if T goes to U, that's true if and only if. T goes to you in this. We do prove that. We prove that in this, in this, um, and it's called, it's called um, parallel beta reduction, this step. So parallel re beta reduction is hold, you know, from T to you hold, if and only if the reflexive transitive closure of ordinary beta reduction holds. And so then we show that this thing is confluent and then from that we get that um, we, we can from one <clears throat> Excuse me. And two, we can show that um, this beta reduction is confluent. So this is going to be the strategy of the proof. Now, let me just, I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm maybe at some point I'm going to give up hope that they, my, um, the email with the, is going to show up, but let me just check one more time. Inbox. No, nope. it is not there. Huh. I don't get it. I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going a lot slower than I would if I had all my written notes out, but so that could be a, a plus. 
Okay, so what is this relation that we're, that we're working with? It's uh, parallel beta reduction. Uh-oh, now what's going on there? And so what this is basically going to allow you to do is do, if there's, you know, K different redexes in one term. So you have one term and there's, you know, a whole bunch of different spots where you could do some beta reduction in the term in this. So I'm drawing a tree to represent the tree structure. And these would be applications where the left branch is a lambda and the right branch, we don't care. And you could do any or all of them at once. You could do none of them, you could do one of them, you could do, um, or you could do all of them in this parallel um, relation, beta reduction. So here's the rules to define the relation. And um, one rule is that says that X parallel reduces to X. And he, in, in the book, he labels the, and so that's like a zero step, right? In zero steps, except that, you know, um, we're defining it in a different way. We're not like defining it like we did before where we just find the K step transitive closure of a relation. And then we said, okay, and the star relation is when, um, when they all have that, you know, when, when, when you take, there exists a K such that you can move from one term to another in terms of K. This one, we're just defining this parallel beta reduction. And then we're going to say, okay, take the tr reflexive transitive closure. And so he labels this rule beta and then these vertical lines parallel sub X. And the next one is more complicated. It says, okay, look, if I have an actual read X, lambda X dot T applied to some, whoop, yeah, lambda X dot T applied to some term A. I'm sorry, my so bad at writing on this thing. And now if I use the same notation that Pierce uses, he was writing his substitutions in front to look like this. X mm -hmm. goes to, um, oh, I didn't want that to be an A, I want that to be a U. Oh, come on. Then X goes to U prime in T prime if is, is a suitable substitution if U parallel reduces to U prime and T parallel reduces to T prime. And this one he would label, oh, beta parallel uh, lambda, I think, or no, um, I forgot what he used for this, A for app or something like that. And I hope I can get them all on the same page. I don't think I can. Um, Another one, so this is basically saying, look, go in U, do as much beta reduction as you want. Go in T, do as much beta reduction as you want in T. You get T prime, you get U prime after doing the beta reduction in U, you get T prime after doing the beta reduction in T. And now go ahead and replace all the, um, in T prime, find all the free X's. So T goes to T prime and replace them by U. So this is essentially, oh, this is beta, beta. That's what he calls it. It's horrible, um, but okay. Yeah, he calls this beta sub beta. 
he puts a little beta down here. Beta sub beta. Okay, and the next one is that um, if I have T applied to U, then that goes to T prime applied to U prime. If T parallel reduces to T prime, and U parallel reduces to U prime. And so that's kind of expected. And then he also allows, I mean, and in some reduction strategies, you don't kind of allow this. I think I have room to write one more rule over here. And this one says you can dive under lambda expressions and do reduction inside of a lambda expression. if t parallel reduces to t prime. So those are the four rules. And so if you, you know, we've done some of this before, but if you look at it, I mean, um, it, it, I think, you know, you'll see that this rule allows you to do beta reduction on the left and beta reduction on the right side of an apply. And, you know, this one allows you to do beta reduction um, under the lambda in T and under, and then to the thing you're applying to in U and then do the substitution here. And it turns out that with these rules, you can do beta reduction in one step, parallel beta reduction in one step to eliminate all the redexes that occur in a term at the time that you see it. Now, when you do a beta reduction, sometimes you introduce new redexes. Those won't really show up in here. The only ones that will show up are the, are the, are the ones that are in a term when you start out and you start traversing through the term. Um, so now in standard, the standard thing is to write down the star and we've already talked a couple of times now about the reflexive transitive closure. So, you know, we're going to just write you know, this is the reflexive transitive closure. Of this. And so that means you can take zero or more steps with this relation. All right, so here's a maybe, I don't know. Does anyone have a question? If I go back, the strategy is we're defining this new parallel relation and then the reflexive transitive closure of that relation. And then we're gonna prove that if T um, parallel reduces to U in zero or more steps, if and only if T beta reduces to U in zero or more steps. And then we're gonna show that this parallel reduction, the re reflexive transitive closure, that is confluent. Whoops, I guess we don't want to go too far. I do have a question, but it's a little bit far back. Um, sure. Since we know that these things reduce uh, and you can do it in any order. Yeah. Okay. Um, doesn't that kind of make it so that you have the, the um, possibility of multiple different trees being equivalent. Isn't that what that implies? Parse trees? Well, I'm not, I'm not, maybe I'm not entirely clear, but one thing to note is that if T beta reduces to U and T beta reduces to U prime, 
then u is beta equivalent to u prime and they're different trees like we saw in the um, previous one, the example where, you know, lambda y dot y is completely different from this one over here on the right. But right. They, can, they can so, always come back together to be identical. They can come back together to be identical but that means that we can have many, if not infinite representations that are um, different parse trees that are actually identical. Um, not usually, sometimes. Like if you have that omega term in there, the one that reduces mm -hmm. to itself, then you get an infinite number, um, you know, you can have omega, well, actually, that's not really a good example, but yeah, there are terms. Well, no, that's a good example because, you know, you can get something like, uh, let's see, like um, lambda y dot, well, I don't know. This is not a good example. Yeah, you don't have to come up with a good example, but it, basically the, the principle is that, yeah, we can have multiple different things and they're all gonna come together to the same Yes. Same result. Right. But I'm not okay. sure that it's always the case that there's an infinite number of, I guess you could have, you could go kind of like up. So it is true in a way. There is always, because you can always add in, uh, you know, the identity in front of everything, right? I mean, it's always going to be the case yeah. that um, if, you know, in his notes, he uses this notation. He says, I is equal to lambda x dot x. And so, you know, if I have any term t, I of t is equal to t, right? Or beta reduces to t. So, I mean, I can always keep adding i's in front. And so it's true that I could have an infinite number of equivalent terms, except that we're doing beta reduction. We're not doing um, backwards beta reduction. Right. Okay. Okay. And this this one would require backwards, you know, to go from T to this would be require backwards beta reduction. You know, you're going the wrong way along the arrow. So anyway, yes, there are lots of things that are going to be syntactically equal that are going to be, um, well, and then let alone that, we have alpha equivalents. So if we ever have any lambda term, we have an infinite number of distinct, you know, syntactically, technically, you know, like lambda x dot x is not equal to identically, well, equal in, in, in Berendrecht's notation to lambda y dot y because those are different variables, but lambda x dot x is, you know, alpha equivalent to lambda y dot y. So, I mean, and, and normally we're kind of like taking it for granted that we allow beta equivalents in there or alpha equivalents in there also. Any other questions? All right, let's see. We, I will use that um, I thing here because in fact, I think it comes up in the next example. So he does, he says, okay, in this book, he says, consider um, the term that is um, lambda x y dot i applied to x y applied to i applied to i. And um, this par parallel beta reduces to 
lambda y dot i applied to y. And then it parallel reduces to in one more step. So in one step of parallel reduction, you can get to here. So what's he doing? He's got um, three things going, three reductions going on at once. He's got um, he's got uh, lambda x y dot i x y applied to i i going to so that beta reduces to lambda y dot i applied to i i applied to y right and another one is is that i x reduces to x, beta reduces to x in one step. And um, I, I, beta reduces to I in one step. And so using these three things together here, so I, I mean, if I, I, in my notes, I said, okay, one, two, and three, you know, if you labeled this by the things that are being incorporated this has three beta reductions to get you from here to here. Okay? Like, you know, you, you can do this one, that's two. Maybe I should circle with a color. You know, you got, you can do this one. That's this. You can do this one. That's this. And then you can do the whole thing. Um, and then, and then, you can do this lambda y dot i y. I mean, we could draw a, um, so this is going in for x. But it's only going to be an i that's going to go in for x. And i x disappears, right? Because this i i gets eliminated by this one and becomes just an i. And I X just becomes X. And then when I replace I for X and here I get this. So that's one step. And then what do we get in the next step? Um, um, get my, let's see if I can put my iPad on its little stand, so. I can see it, you know, and then and then this one goes in the next case to oops lambda y dot y. Oh, come on, lambda y dot y. So that's what you could do in two steps, but you can see that, you know, you can string them together. You can, you can build this thing that happens in one step here with multiple steps of um, beta reduction. And we don't need to apply all of them at once. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, you don't have to apply them all at once, but you can. Okay. Now, here's the first of many lemmas.
And I don't know, maybe this is a good one. Lemma 3.4.2.1. And it says that for every T, T parallel reduces to T. And the proof And, you know, he doesn't even give the proof. He says, by induction on the derivation uh, or on the term T, now, what would that mean to do? What am I doing if I'm doing induction on the term T? Well, we have to go back and we have to figure out, remember that the lambda terms are either an individual variable or they're like a T1 applied to a T2 or they're a lambda X dot T. And so we got to say, okay, suppose T is a variable. Um, case one, t is equal to x, a variable. But um, x goes to X by the rule, which was called parallel beta X or VAR maybe. So that's good. Now, if T is of the form um, T U, let's see, T applied to U case two, T is of the form, I don't know, U1 applied to U2. Then then we have that We want to show that U1 applied to U2 parallel reduces to U1 applied to U2. But this is true if U1, so what's the induction hypothesis here? Can anyone tell me? Come on, somebody, I know that somebody can tell me. I'll, I'll redo that. It's a shame to erase something that was so well written, but okay. Well, the induction hypothesis, what we get to assume is that this is smaller than T. So we get to assume that U1, and what we're trying to do is show that it reduces to itself. And U2, reduces to itself. So assume those two things, but then that is exactly the rule that says that U1, U2 would parallel reduce to U1, U2, because where, um, if we go back and look at the rule, Um, this is the rule here. If T goes to T prime and U goes to U prime, then T applied to U goes to T prime applied to U to prime. 
but by our induction hypothesis, I don't know why I have all these empty pages, we're allowed to assume that U1 goes to U1 and U2 parallel reduces to U2. And then we can use those two things to build a proof that U1 applied to U2 parallel reduces to U1 applied to U2. All right, I, I need somebody to say something now. I have never seen an induction proof that is done like this. Okay. Yeah, I haven't either. This is different. This is completely a different way of doing things. This is why everybody is silent. It's okay. like, okay, yes, I see that this is happening, but I have never seen anything approach this way. All right. So Philip is exactly right. <laughs> okay. Technically, we could justify that this by saying what we're doing is induction on the height of the um, derivation tree. And clearly, if you're looking at this rule down here at the bottom, if you're looking at this rule here, if this tree has height, you know, K or this tree, you know, you take the maximum of the heights and then add one to get the height of this derivation tree, okay? And so now you can do induction on this thing by saying essentially we're doing induction on the height of the derivation tree that T U arrow uh, parallel reduces to T prime U prime because this, maybe I should write it out more explicitly, this, derivation tree is shorter than this one. So we're doing like complete induction where we're assuming that this one and this one are both smaller than this, the whole tree, and that's true. So we're trying to show this, but we get to assume this and we get to assume this because those trees are smaller. Maybe I should write it out like here a little bit more and. In, in um, so let's see. Now there are, um, and so this is really, I should say, you know, the height. Of the derivation. So if you go back and I mean, I wish I could copy and paste. I don't know how to do that. Is there, if somebody knows, let me tell me. But if I go back to these rules, these four rules, the height of, okay, let me label them all. This one here is, is um, beta parallel app. And this is beta parallel lambda. And so, Um, the height the height of beta x parallel is equal to zero. The height of beta beta parallel is equal to the height or max of the heights of the two sub derivations. This is a tree, this is a tree. Is this helping or not, Phil? Uh, this definitely helps. Okay, um, so I look, there's three parts here. So my confusion I'll call this delta one, Call this delta two, 
is equal to the um, max of the height of delta one, delta two, plus one. And if this is a delta one and this is a delta two, those are separate derivations then I think you could guess the rest of them is that, you know, the height of the beta parallel app rule is equal to the same thing. You just add one because I'm going one deeper, but I take the max of those two. And then the height of, um, beta lambda parallel is equal to the height. And this would be the delta one derivation above it of delta one plus one. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, that helps. As soon okay. as you said we were doing it on the height, that actually helped too. I think my confusion was at the point where we did a, an induction rule that didn't make things smaller or didn't factor things. Yeah, well, always yeah. The, the, the antecedent. So this is a kind of, these are kinds of proof rules essentially, right? You can use these to prove that some term is in this double arrow relation to this term. You can use it to prove that this right. term is in relation to that one. And so when you build one of these trees, um, that tree is the structure of the tree is going to be determined by the syntax of the terms that you're talking about. And so he says, okay, look at the syntax of the term on the left that, you know, when, when we're trying to do this thing, look at, it's going to be induction on the, where did I go? Where's my, here it is. Uh, look at T. If T is a variable, we have a rule that just says T X goes to X. If T is an application of U1, U2, then by our induction hypothesis, we know U1 goes to U1. That's what we're trying to prove. And we know that U2 goes to U2 because those are not trees that are shorter than the one that we have. But then if you go back and look at the actual rule for application, if this goes to this, then that means this goes, you know, we're, we're then T prime is T. And on this branch, U prime is U in the case that we're in down here. And so we can just write this. This is an instance of the rule um, this is an instance of the beta parallel app rule where T is equal to U1 uh, and U is equal to u2 and t prime is equal to u1 and u prime is equal to u2 so if i take these values and i plug them into the rule this rule t is u1 u is u u2 t prime is u1 so i've got that and then uh, u prime is u2 that's an instance of this rule okay all right somebody else this is like absolutely fundamental 
for understanding uh, lots and lots of the, this is the main reason really why it's so wonderful that we only have three constructors because every time we want to do something, we have to prove it for, I haven't finished case three. We have to do the Lambda case now. Every time we want to prove something by on induction on the structure of a term, we have to consider all the possible ways the terms are constructed. And there's only three ways, but that means three cases, right? I, I've got a question at this stage. Um, okay. So can you give us an idea then how we're going to use this proof later on within the course? Yeah, this one, well, we're going to use it today because this one is one of the lemmas that is actually the most trivial lemma in the proof that um, beta reduction is confluent the, in the proof of this theorem. Now, we will, you know, I mean, it's kind of like a little cottage industry in a way for the people that really know how to do these proofs really well. Every time you design some kind of new slightly variant of a system and you know, almost all lambda, cal all lambda calculi of any use are confluent, but you've added some little different thing, you're gonna have to prove that it's confluent all over. Um, so this is something that people who do research in this area run across all the time. And this is an astounding property. You know, you probably need like a weekend to try to come up, you know, you could try to write down some terms and find an example where this isn't true. I mean, because we're proving it, it would be a waste of your time. But um, this is something that we use over and over again. This is a fundamental property. But this lemma is the most trivial lemma. He doesn't even write down the proof. He just says, oh, by induction on the term T. And I'm even wondering if he doesn't really mean to say by induction on the derivation of TROT, because I don't see how to do it just on the term T. I see how to do it using the proof rules, but I don't see how to do it. So here's case three. If I can. Wow. Ah. Okay, where are you? Case three. Okay, T is equal to lambda x dot u. And so we need to show that lambda x dot u parallel reduces to just lambda x dot u. And, but we get to assume that u parallel reduces to u because this is a subterm, it's a smaller term than um, the t. And so, and then I'll say, okay, but by beta parallel lambda, lambda x dot u parallel beta reduces to lambda x dot u if and only if u parallel reduces to u, but we get to assume that because the derivation of this is one one less than the derivation of that. Or 
by induction on the structure of the term, this term is smaller than the lambda term. So the theorem would hold for that one too. Okay, and so that completes that. All right, I want to hear from, I don't know, someone else. Clay, what does this look like to you? Is this gobbledygook? So the diagrams and things remind me of like Cayley tables from group theory and mathematics. Like mm -hmm. I, it's very loosely kind of related of how you kind of flow through and look at things like normal subgroups and how you can generate things. Like that's what this reminds me of. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't have a concrete connection to this, but my intuition is leaning towards that. Okay. I guess I don't, remember enough group theory to know about Cayley groups, but um, yeah, I mean, maybe in a way, if you take like the, um, the group of um, permutations, right? And you say like, okay, you can map from one permutation to another and you could, but you could also go from a different permutation. You know, you could make a branching tree. You say like, okay, start out with a list of things, a permutate, go to this permutation following some map that permutes the things. go over here. Well, then there's always going to be a permutation that brings you back to the common thing. I don't know, maybe that's the kind of thing you're thinking of, but I'm not sure. Keegan. I think that's in line. Um Go ahead, Clay. So my question would be, if you have to go through this process for each new term that you've defined, is there any way to like get a classification of terms and say, oh, if we've proved it for this type of term, then I don't have to go through this every single time. Yeah, but for the most part, you end up every, every one of the lemmas that, we're, that we have to prove to prove this thing goes by a proof that looks like this because they're new facts. Okay. So yeah, you might be able to generalize the term structure and then maybe that's what the category theorists would try to do and then try to generalize the proof that, but this is a pretty specific property that we're looking at here. All right, let's look at the next one. That makes sense. Um, I kind of like the next one and I didn't prove So I don't know the proof of the next one. So maybe I'm gonna have to get like, you know, Keegan is gonna have to help me here. So, you know, get your headphones out and tuned up Keegan. Or Finley, I think Finn has already read this stuff, maybe. Okay, and this one's more interesting. The first one was was pretty boring. Oh, um, okay, this is, I'm sorry. I got to go to lemma one. Um, it's not, I'm not up to two yet. I'm still on one. This one's still kind of boring, but maybe not. This one says, uh, look, if T beta reduces to U, then T parallel beta reduces to U. And this is in one step. I think this one's so easy, it's not worth trying to write the proof down. But the proof is by induction on the derivation of T arrow U. Um, oh, my God. Okay, it's um, proof. By induction on the derivation T 
beta reduces to u. So let's say that we're going to skip this one and that you guys can try to prove this one yourself. You'll have to remember the definition of T arrow U beta though. We could write it down. Does anyone want to see what that is? I mean, we have written it down before, but I think, you know, to, to, to actually, um, do that proof, you got to have that definition. So what does it look like? It looks like something like, um, lambda x dot t applied to u, beta reduces to using Pierce's notation for substitution, x goes to u, that substitution applied to t. And then another rule, then the rules that make it a compatible relation with a lambda structure basically say that um, T applied to U beta reduces to <clears throat> T prime U if uh, T beta reduces to T prime. T applied to U beta reduces to T U prime if U beta reduces to U prime. And lambda x dot t beta reduces to lambda x dot t prime if t beta reduces in one step to t prime. I'm sorry this got so messy up here. Should I rewrite it? So this basically is just saying, look, here's the basic definition of beta reduction, the first thing up here, right? This top thing, this is what we call beta reduction. But these things down here allow us to do it anywhere in a term. So, you know, if I have a term, that looks like the one that we had before. Let me see, I can reuse it with maybe without having to write out a whole bunch more stuff. If we look at like this term here, we could either use those rules to justify doing a beta reduction in here, or we could use those rules to justify doing the orange one. Now then, we don't have a rule that says that every term reduces to itself in one step. This is one step of beta reduction. This is one step of beta reduction. This is one more step of beta reduction, but this one can't reduce to itself in one step. It has to reduce in zero steps. So that's why I put the star over that. Okay. Okay, so this is kind of ugly. I mean, God, why is there no, I don't have any way of grabbing a thing. What does this do? Yeah, that separates that rule from the other ones, but how do I get it to do anything? Okay. Oh, I don't want the double. 
So here's the rules. There's four of them. Any question? Come on, somebody say something. I know everyone is like kind of floundering. All right, so here's the proof of the first one. This one was dead trivial. This one's pretty darn easy also because more or less this parallel reduction, all the parallel reduction, I mean, it does maybe show you something about the parallel reduction because here's the rules for parallel reduction. And I guess I can do this. So here's one. Now, parallel reduction, they're allowing you to do variable goes to variable, but here's the one for um, C and R. All right, this is just beta reduction, but not only are they just allowing you to do ordinary beta reduction, they're allowing you then to first go under into T and into U and doing some reduction in there. And then here is the application rule. So rather than in the other rule set that we just wrote down, we only allowed you to go up into T to go to T prime in one rule. And then in a separate rule, we allowed you to go in U to U prime. So you could do either one branch or the other, but not both. And here you can do both, which is why we get parallel reduction. And then this one is the same as what we had for that um, other rule. So those are the four rules for parallel beta reduction. These are the four rules for um, single step beta reduction anywhere in a term. And the new lemma says, if you can do single step beta reduction that goes from T to U, then T also can do multi-step or parallel beta reduction to get to you. And that one should be kind of obvious, but let's try the next one. The next one looks a little bit interesting to me. And I mean, I haven't tried to prove it. So let's see what we get. This is any questions, please holler out. You know, people always say this, kind of silly thing. It says like, oh, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Well, you know, in some way it's true. If you have a question, probably someone else has the same question. They're just too shy to answer it. I mean, there is no dumb question. Okay. This one well, looks- Okay, I, I do have two questions okay. there. Good. I mean, it goes back to what I asked earlier. Um, Where would you use you, know, you wear my background? Well, in respect to the course then, so, so how are we going to apply these kind of lemmas and proofs to when we start looking at the Plutus core language? And if and when we start doing some Haskell, again, you know, isn't this kind of underneath the hood in Haskell? So would we even be aware of what's happening or even use well, it when we start doing Haskell? Okay, well, Simon, the course is not really about Haskell. It's about the theory that is behind the Plutus, the design of Plutus core, so that you could read, for example, and understand one of the Plutus core papers, not so that you could program Plutus core, although maybe we'll get to that, but really it's for students who would like to be able to do research in the area of programming languages around you know, the kind of system that Plutus Core provides. And Plutus Core provides, and in that first, oh, you missed the first lecture and I think I forgot to record it. In that first lecture, we read kind of like through the introduction of one of the Plutus Core papers. And I highlighted all of the um, kind of technical terms in there that they use. And, you know, one of them is 
system F, well, we're almost dis describing system F because system F is, but it, we're not that close. I mean, we're still doing untyped lambda calculus just to get the ideas that are all in and around lambda calculus. Then we're going to go to system F as a type lambda calculus, but it's even more, it's, um, it's a polymorphic, well, system F omega is the polymorphic type lambda calculus. And so then that's a whole nother level of thing. And then we're going to have to add the mu types and almost everything that we're going to do throughout the course is going to look a lot like what we're doing now. Now, a homework could be like, okay, uh, write down a Haskell program to do parallel reduction. And that would, wouldn't be a bad one to make, maybe help you understand this better. But um, yeah, this is the course, is reading, being able to read this uh, theoretical material that is behind the Plutus core language. Is that good? Does that... So, I mean, yeah, Lemma 3.4.3.1, completely insignificant in the big picture. Except that in the picture of how do you prove something about lambda terms, it's pretty significant. For this particular theorem, which is essentially like you might call this the fundamental theorem of lambda calculus is that it's confluent. So this is a pretty important thing. Now, if you're, you know, I don't know, if you're never going to do any research in this area, then maybe it's not that important to understand the proof, just to have an idea that it's true. And that's kind of the goal except I want to show you how these kinds of things are proved. You know, I notice it's, it's 2.20. Do you want to take a five minute break? That'd be fantastic. Yes, okay. I need that. Okay, me too. All right, let's take a little five minute break. All right.
Let me just check my mail and see. Well, I'm still in my unfinished basement. Yeah. You could imagine that it's actually a nice place to work. I like it, but it's very unfinished. <laughs> <laughs> Subterranean. <clears throat> it's your little mad scientist lab. I just... It, checked, it is. I, I just checked my mail to see if um, those notes ever came through. They still haven't come through. So, all right, I'll keep, I don't know. This is, it's painful how ugly my handwriting is, but I don't know. It seems to be marginally functional. The best solution to our, our all these things like the marginally functional handwriting and stuff like that is that we we all get back to teaching in person. Yeah. <laughs> in in my class, I, just, I have I just, this. I'm I'm afraid though that they're far too in um, optimistic about that happening next fall in September. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Um, I, I have in one of my classes a lecture that I've done before that I've done by virtue of being able to put up 12 different prepared, I want to call them slides, but I use like 24 by 18 pieces of paper that are written on. I actually tape them up so that I can work in between them and mark things. And that has worked in the past, but I can't do that over the web. Okay, so I've actually had two of my former students helping me work out a different way to present the same material. Uh huh. And I think I finally got it. One of them says, yes, this actually works this time. But this is, is you know, out of my whole class, I've got all these other lectures done and this is like take seven on this lecture. Huh. Okay, it's yeah. horrible, and and that that means I've actually gotten these people to look through six previous versions of the same material for me. It's like ah. All right, I don't know. Is everyone back? Yes. No. Maybe we yes. should do, do a little like round table, and you should say hello to everyone else. That would Simon, be a nice thing. Are you back? All right. Yes, I'm back. Oh, okay. I don't know. If you have video, let me stop my sharing if I can. I don't know. It's like, why is it so hard to stop sharing? Okay. I don't know. If you have video, turn it on and just say hello to everyone. Ah, there you are. Should I start off? Hey, there's another person. Yeah. Everybody's coming up. There's Keegan. I don't know. Just go around and say hello and say who you are. Maybe we already did this, but Simon, just remind us who are you and what do you, I'm, I'm looking at the order of that you show up on my screen and I've got you first. So hi, Simon so Alexander. Um, I actually work full time within ARC uh, within the university. Um, I'm the HPC software manager slash programmer analyst. Um, but I'm doing a PhD part time uh, with uh, Dr. Banish as my supervisor. Um, and I am much more of a practical than a theorist. Um, so I do struggle on stuff like this. So that's where my 
unintentionally awkward questions arise from. Um, that's me. I'll pass on to Keegan. Philip. Oh, don't ask. <laughs> Keegan, well, I'm doing it in the order that people are on my screen. Keegan. Um, I am a computer science PhD right now, advised by uh, Dr. Caldwell. Um, currently working on programming languages, uh, mainly smart contract programming languages. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Sushan. Uh, hi, my name is Suzan. Uh, I'm a currently master's student in computer science um, and I'm currently working on writing and understanding some of the smart contract and just trying to discover the topic of research and trying to do some research in the smart contract area and then advised by Dr. Carwell. But officially, uh, Dr. Mike is my advisor. Zach Harris. Hi, I'm Zach Harris. I'm a new PhD student this spring. Uh, I'm going, or I'm trying to do research in continuous learning and like meta learning stuff. So it'll be fun. Phil. Um, I'm a professor of practice here in the computer science department, and my area is primarily blockchain, although I do some, some artificial intelligence stuff with blockchain. Uh, I have had a lot of database experience over the years. I built a venture funded startup and sold it many years ago that was a database company. And I'm interested in this class because I want to be able to program Plutus Core directly, as in build things that will actually write code to Plutus Core and make it run. Clay. Carper. What was the question? I'm sorry. I just say hello and maybe kind of introduce yourself a little bit. Just, you know, I think maybe we did we do this already once, but in any case, just I mean, I don't even remember who everyone is. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I I'm Clay. Um, I'm a PhD student in the computer science department. Um, I've done some machine learning projects in the past. Um, I'm currently working on adapting a Python package to go from um, solving dual porosity Stokes equations to um, solving Navier Stokes dual porosity. Um, I am working with Dr. Craig Douglas in the math department still. Uh, he was my advisor in the past. I don't have a primary computer science advisor yet, but um, I'm interested in a lot of different topics. <laughs> Great. Kyle. Kyle. Um, I've got pretty unstable internet connection right now, but um, so okay. I might crash. I've crashed a couple times, but I'm uh, just a, I'm a senior in computer science here, uh, just in my uh, senior design right now, finishing that this semester. Um, okay. And I guess like our group is doing a uh, existing yes. gesture recognizer that will like take in a new gesture that we're trying to customize. So. All right. Great. Thanks. Jessa. Yes. Uh, uh oh, she disappeared. She looked like she was in some kind of public place where. All right. Let's go back to the lemmas that um let me share my Screen. Okay, so lemma 3.4.3.2. And I think this one actually is, you know, like you need to, you know, if you start thinking about these things, um, 
So we have like if T parallel reduces to U, then I want to go above that spot. That is so weird. Then, huh? Um, T. Oh, come on. What is it doing? Uh, T. Oh, come on. It won't write anymore. What's wrong? Wow, this is terrible. My internet's not that good either, but. Okay. Come on, my Wacom pad's not working. Now this is going to get worse. T. Um, ah. Beta reduces in zero or more steps. To you. Uh, let me see if I, oh, I apologize, this is terrible, but maybe if I go to my, um, settings, Okay, let me see. Now, maybe this will work. I don't know. Let me try sharing again. Okay. All right. Good. Proof. Sorry. I don't know. I just had to, like, reset the Wacom in there. Okay. So, if T parallel reduces to U, then... T reduces in zero, beta reduces in zero or more steps to you. And um, so the proof is by induction on the derivation that T double arrow U. Okay, so now we got to look at the induction rules and t, if t is a variable x, then um, we know that x double arrow goes to x and because this star is the reflexive transitive closure. We know that this thing goes to X in zero steps in specifically. So this is case one. Case two is that T is a lambda x dot t prime uh, 
And we need to go back and I need to go back and look at the rule or maybe I have it right here. I can, I can, without showing it to you, maybe I can just do it. I can say, okay, look, remember, there's two kind of rules that could have applied. Suppose that, um, maybe the way, maybe the way I'm describing this is not quite the way that I should, I should say, by the induction on the derivation and case one is really that it is that you, that, that, that part's all true, but what we're doing really is looking at the, the beta parallel X role. So then T must be of the form X. And then this has to be U because of the form of the rule. In case two is we're looking at the beta beta parallel rule. So that means we have something that looks like lambda x dot t applied to you double arrow x u prime t prime so this is oh maybe i should make that something besides u i don't know i'll call it um u one and u one prime and the rule says that okay so t has to go to uh t prime and that u one has to go to u one prime so that's that was if that was the last rule then we get to assume what that that um, T beta reduces in zero or more steps to T prime, because that's above the line here, that's a smaller term. And that U beta reduces in some number of steps to U, I'm sorry, U1 goes to U1 prime in some number of beta steps. And now I have to show that this thing here, now show that lambda x dot t u1 beta reduces and some number of steps to x arrow u1 prime t prime. Well, by the first thing we have here, this first assumption, we know that lambda x dot t u1 prime beta reduces in some number of steps to lambda x dot T prime apply, applied to U1 because we could do beta reduction in here and we've assumed that this is true. So we do those beta reductions for the T to the T prime to get us from this one to this one. And then that beta reduces in some number of steps because U goes to U prime. That beta reduces in some number of steps to lambda X 
dot t prime applied to u1 prime. And then in one step of beta reduction, that goes to replace all the x's in um, t prime by u1 prime. Okay, questions about that? Because this is a smaller derivation than the whole one we're trying to show, we get to assume the theorem is true for that one. And we know that if t goes to u, in this case, u is t prime. So if t goes to t prime, we know that t in zero or more steps with beta reduction goes to t prime. So we get to assume this over here. And we get to assume that u1 goes in some number of steps to u1 prime. And then we have to show that this is true, that this goes in some number of steps to that. And so I'm sort of, I mean, almost there really, but I mean, we also maybe have a little, we should write down, there's like, we're, we're going to depend on a little lemma that we didn't write down maybe that is like if, you know, if T goes in some number of steps to, let's say, T prime, and T prime goes in some number of steps to, let's say, U, then, so if this is true, then T goes in some number of steps. This is what the trans reflective transitive closure gives you. T goes right to U in some number of steps. So now I can put these steps together. So this one going to that one and this one going to that one means that this one goes directly to that one. And now this one that together with this gives me the final result that I want, which is you can glue these things together. The last step is just one step of beta reduction because that's when I actually do this. So we finally get lambda x dot t u1 beta reduces in some number of steps to x u u1 prime t prime questions this is the worst rule let's go back and look at the other rules, uh, there's two, there's still two more, unfortunately, like here's, no, this is for beta reduction. We're looking at the arrow rule. And so we've done this rule. Uh, we did this one. We just did this one, which is the worst one. And now we got to do these two. And they're pretty, pretty straightforward. They're pretty trivial. So case three, whoops, I want to be black. Okay, case three. Uh, the last rule was The last rule in the derivation of T 
arrow u was the beta parallel app rule, i.e. we have something that looks like um, I, I got to change the names here. So this is, the, you know, T and U are things we're using everywhere. We want to show that T, let's say T1, T2, the rule looks like this, goes to T1 prime, T2 prime. And the rule says that T1 parallel reduces to T1 prime and T2 parallel reduces to T2 prime. So we assume by the induction hypothesis that T1 beta reduces in zero or more steps to T1 prime and T2 beta reduces in zero or more steps to T2 prime and must show that T1, T2 beta reduces in zero or more steps to T1 prime, T2 prime. But T1, T2 beta reduces in zero or more steps to T1 prime, T2, which beta reduces in zero or more steps to T1 one prime t2 prime and so the case is complete because we can if this goes in let's say k steps and this goes in j steps then it goes in k plus j steps Any question? I mean, it's why he didn't write all these down because they're really simple once you see the pattern of what's going on. Keegan, does this like seem natural to you? You've been working on programming languages for a while now. Yeah, this makes sense to me. All right, and then there's one final case, which is um, case four, the last rule in the derivation of T parallel U was the beta parallel lambda rule. Then we have something that looks like, you know, lambda x dot t1 or t1 I meant goes to Lambda x dot t1 prime if t, oh, and that's double. If t1 double arrow goes to t1 prime. By the induction hypothesis, t1 goes to T1 prime and 
And so lambda x dot t1 beta reduces in some number of steps to lambda x dot t1 prime. And that completes the proof. So, I don't know. I mean, why do I think this one's sort of interesting? Because you're relating um, this parallel reduction and you're saying, if there's one step of parallel reduction from T to U, then there's some way to simulate that by doing some number of individual steps of beta reduction. And then we get to the final kind of like, uh, you know, an important lemma that says, um, lemma, 3.4.3.3, which says that if T goes, T goes in the transitive closure ah, of parallel reduction to you, if and only if T goes in the transitive closure of beta reduction to you. So this is basically the point where we're claiming, okay, these two relations essentially do the same thing. So how do you prove an if and only if? Um, somebody? Well, you, you assume, both directions. yeah, you got to go both directions. So like in this way, you assume that T goes in some number of steps to you and show T beta reduces in some number of steps to you. But this more or less follows directly from the previous lemma. that and the definition of the transitive closure of this, of uh, the parallel reduction 3.4.3.2 plus So this means that before we, the, lem the previous lemma showed us in one step if we could go in one step from T to U in this parallel reduction, then we could go in some number, zero or more steps of beta reduction. Now we have that if we can go in um, some number of steps, well, you just glue them all together to get this one. And then the other direction, which I don't see he claims by same lemma 3.4.2. So we assume T beta reduces in some number of steps to you show that um, T parallel reduces in some number of steps to you. I'm not sure why he claims 3.4.3.2 helps you there, but Oh, I guess be, it's not really that one so much as one of the ones that we had much earlier, which was that um, if, 
if T beta reduces, then T hour reduces. So this is 3.4.3.1. I'm thinking he's got a typo in there. He really wants to say That's the beta. Okay. So now we have this very strong result and we have one minute left. And I guess I'm just going to have to show you, well, this is kind of cool. Um, I'll show you that first we proved, th we proved three things now. And I'll give you the assignment will be to read this and maybe um, to do some stuff with it. But he proves three things. One is local confluence. And that says if I have some T and I can go in one step to U and I go in one parallel step to, let's say, I don't know, U prime, then there's a V that I can get to also in one step. So that's kind of interesting. If you diverge by taking one step of parallel reduction and you take one step of parallel reduction to get a U prime, then there's a way to get back through those in one step. Now this one takes like three, two to three pages to prove. This is kind of like the hardest lemma in this thing. And then he says, oh, and this one I found kind of interesting. He says, look, if T goes, and this is a star here to U prime, and T goes in one step this way to U, Then to get to V, you got to do many steps on this leg and only one step on this one. Although, th these are the dotted lines. These things exist, right? And then... Finally, he's able to prove, okay, with that one. So this one helps improve this one. And then this one helps improve the one that says, okay, if T goes in some number of steps this way and goes in some number of steps that way, parallel reduction to U and U prime, then there is this V and this is dotted. Ah, there's a V down here. And that's a star. And this one is a um, dotted line with a star on it. So this is confluence for parallel reduction. And then We had that one that said that this, oops, wrong our kind of arrow. Um, the double arrow star is true if, you know, if only, if and only if this beta arrow star. So we, now we use that to give us confluence. So we get T beta star u beta up oh, beta star u prime like this I think my V is 
is really uh, I need to Okay, and so this is the final proof of confluence. And I guess I'll just stop there. I mean, there are two quick corollaries that from this and a few, and maybe we'll talk about them next time. But I would say that of all the theorems about the untyped lambda calculus, um, that this is kind of the fundamental theorem of untyped lambda calculus is that you can always um if 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 la if um if terms that are beta equivalent diverge in your choice of redexes to reduce it doesn't matter you're going to end up at the same place anyway thoughts Questions? I don't know. I, that's a pretty nice thing. Philip. Um, I don't know. It means that you've got a lot of possibilities for reducing and you have a big set of directions to go in. It also means that you can take this as if I go to do reduction, I can just start at any arbitrary point and just start. That's right. Which now is the very only, valuable. The only problem the ability is, to just say I can start anywhere and just run it. Yeah. The only problem is is that some paths might not lead to a normal form while others will. And a normal form is just a term where there's no more reduction. And so we'll look at that next right. time. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Sorry, I, I don't know. I mean, send me an email if you think this is horrible, me writing on this darn thing. I'm sorry, but my notes still, I, I will put up the notes though, which are much prettier. Okay, anyway, so long. Bye. I'll Thank put you. up reading and homework. <laughs>